Enrique, thanks for uh, being here with us today. And the um, reason I wanted to have you on the podcast was uh, I don't know the whole history, but I've just uh, watching from the start, at least the visible part you showed us, uh, starting the, the food truck journey mm-hmm. to where you're at right now. It's been a short period of time, but but just the growth that we've seen from you, and I think you're actually feeling that growth. What yes. You just won a, uh, an award with a Bayou Jam Wolves Award. Yes, it was a Taste of the Tailgate. Taste of the Tailgate, and you were competing with, I mean, well-established restaurants here yes. in town. So what, what did that feel like to win that? Man, I got called... Um, the day before by Jam, uh, then they were going to announce it. Actually, the day that they were going to announce it, which was Friday. And uh, they are like, hey, we just want to call you tell you you won. And I was like, excuse me? And they are like, yeah, you won. And I'm like, did you triple check? Did you, are you sure? Like, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm not trying to say that, you know, like, you're wrong. But I was just so humbled that I, I, I got to do that stuff with, like you said, well-established restaurants. Because mm-hmm. um, there was, I mean, Iron Cactus is someone who has been – um, in the community and serving the community for more than 12, 12 years, 13 years, you know. Um, and that guy knows uh, the Pastor Jason at, at the Calhoun campus really well. Cause one of our favorite other. restaurants. Right. It's great. That was one of the first restaurants I went to when I moved here, too. And, um, yeah, Iron Cactus, there was Nukes, there was Kayla's Kitchen, there was um, Catfish, um, Scott's Catfish. Yeah. And so they're just like r- brick and mortars. And so I'm thinking in my head, I told Alex, I'm like, you know, I don't really want to compete because there's no competition like i'm a food truck they're restaurants yeah and uh she was like well just go and just showcase your your taco what you're good at you know how to do that and i was like okay let me do that and and you know in return there's good publicity and like i serve the community through this event and then i got that call and was like well dang that's that's pretty cool that some what well, the majority vote thought that I, that my item was good and so yeah, you know fantastic. i'm kind of you know it, it's just been it's been a very humbling experience because uh, I started this as a side hustle. It was just to pay for daycare. You well, know? Why don't you take us back? So you're not originally from here. Um, I think I saw where, was it Texarkana is where you mm-hmm. were born? Yep. So um, Texarkana, uh, how many how many uh, brothers and sisters? I got two brothers and then one stepsister, three okay. brothers and one stepsister. Okay. Um, two kids from my dad's side, and actually this is crazy, but – uh, my dad is not my biological father, but he raised me. My biological father is out of the picture before I was even born. Um, or maybe he came right after I was, but, like, never knew him, never saw him. I still, right. to this day, don't know what he even looks like. Um, but my non-biological father, Freddie, is my real dad. That's what I call him. But um, he, uh, yeah, he took he took my mom, you know, he met my mom. They fell in love and uh, took my brother and I, Jose, who's the oldest, mm-hmm. then it's me, and then we have a younger brother that they had together, which okay. is Rudy, and he's in the Marines. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Semper Fi. We, we love our military and any any men or women in uniform. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he took us in, he raised me, and he's, he's you know, that's where that's where life started was Texarkana, but he's a restauranteur, so our whole life was always, for, mm-hmm. for the majority of the time of my young youth, we were moving all the time because he would, you know, he'd go open a restaurant, train the staff, get them running to the next thing. Open it up, you know, get the, get them running, go to the next one, you know. Well, he had to be good at what he was doing if he was the guy that they had to come in he's, to open them up, get them yeah. started. And I'm biased, but he was, he's the best, you know, awesome. and I feel like no matter what he touched in the restaurant world, he it was excellent. So um, what? Um, how old were you when y'all left Texarkana? When we left Texarkana, man, I was probably uh, a year or two years old, you know, very young. Um, from And I'm trying to remember this from the way my mom tells us our backstory because it's all like, all scattered, you know. Sure. But a majority of my life was Florida. All um, right, Florida. Yeah. So <clears throat> take me to Florida. Where did you spend the most time in Florida at? Fort Myers. Fort Myers. Fort Myers is home. You know, I, I know I live here and this is my home. But sure. But if someone were to say, like, where is home? You know, if you were to take back to, like, where it all started, Fort Myers, Florida. Why is that? Just kind of it's what just, you know? Man, this is what I know. Yeah, I grew up there. I went through elementary school there, through middle school and through high school, like my whole life there. And that's all really I ever knew before I moved to Louisiana. Um, and, you know, my wife and I decided it's time to go to Louisiana and well, for the same country. So where in Florida is Fort Myers? I can't place it. So <coughs> this is the best way to do it visually, <clears throat> right? But it's like the gun kind of shape. Oh, yeah. It's over here. Okay. 
thinking. Yeah, over here. Yeah. So it's on the ocean side? Not ocean the, side, yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. So you grow up, you do most of your schooling in Florida, mm -hmm. and then at some point the decision was, we're going to Louisiana. Yeah, my what wife brought and you? I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what, yeah, what brought you to Louisiana? My wife and I, so when we lived over here, I really loved the idea of the country. I know that sounds crazy because everybody that asked me, you came from where? From Florida? What in the world brought you over here? Why would you ever want to move to Louisiana? Um, but I love the small town uh, feel of Calhoun. Well, every time we would visit her mom and her dad, I just loved that. That felt homey, you know, cozy. Sure. Um, and so when we had our, our first son, Zane, um, we, me and her, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know God. God was not in my life. And I was very troubled, man, very troubled. We had issues in our marriage. And I remember looking at her one night and was just like, look, I, I want to make this work, but I don't have the solution. I don't know what to do. I don't know what mm. I need. I know there's a problem. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's us. But we need to fix something or this is going to fall apart. And our son's going to be raised in a broken home. You know, mom and dad's here. How many years ago are we talking? We're talking, my son is seven. So we're talking about five years ago. Okay, five, five years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And so, uh, man, we just looked at each other and we're like, she, she was like, what if we moved to Louisiana? Now, said, you met uh, her in Florida, right? I met her in Louisiana when we had El Chico's. Okay. Yeah. When okay. we ran that, she was a server, and I, we just one thing led to another. We fell in love, you know. We okay. worked together and just started dating. and um, But then, you know, we dated for a little while, and then my dad decided after, you know, a year of running El Chico's, it was tough on our family. We, mm -hmm. it, it, The emotional toll of having your entire family up there every single day. There wasn't a day we didn't see that restaurant. And um, whether it was busting tables, serving, cooking, whatever, because we couldn't find good help. Sure. And so it was tough to just run that business. Um, it was successful, and there was it was making money. But my dad would not want, didn't want to trade our sanity and our mm -hmm. close knit, you know, being a close knit family, for a restaurant. So he decided, let's just go back home. You know, I'll I'll work the job I was at. You know, managing a waterfront eatery. Your mom can do her cleaning business. Y'all can go back to the school you went to and just. Leave it all at that. But it wasn't as easy because I fell in love with someone and was like, well, now what do I do here? Would I just break it off and just go mm -hmm. to Florida? And so we tried long distance for a little while, and then she moved to Florida. And then that's, you know, had our baby Zane. And then we got married, and then we decided, yeah, let's go to Florida. Uh, let's go to Louisiana because it's not working over here. You know, we need to, we need to change something. We need to slow down if we want to if we want to fix this. Right. We need to figure out how to slow down. And her folks are from Calhoun. And her dad offered, like, hey, you come and you stay with us, you know, in a little while we can get you a trailer and a little piece of land and y'all can just get established, get on your feet. And so that's how that that's how that happened. So job wise, when you come to Louisiana, what was um, I'm sure you didn't have a job or were you, mm -hmm. what, what did you start off doing when you came here? Well, so uh, Huey, who's my father in law, is very connected, very well known in Calhoun and Farmville, Sterlington area. Um, everybody knows Huey just because he's been in the school system, but mm -hmm. he was also a youth pastor at Sterlington okay. Baptist for a little while, um, way, way back. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Cross Camp, but he's one of the guys that started that with a group okay. of other men. And now not, it's not real familiar with it, but yeah, okay. It's this, it's this huge camp, you know, 800, 900 students now. I'm sure it was probably the same then. Um, but anyway, he was one of the founding fathers of that okay, thing. Okay, great. Um, just real solid. He led me to Christ, you know. But he uh, he knew people and found me a job at Ryan Chevrolet. Okay. Through a guy that he hunted with at a hunting camp. And so they're like, well, we got this job opening. He can be kind of like a helping hand in the shop or do accessories or, you know. And that turned into spraying bedliners. So I sprayed bedliners for about a year. Um and in the process of the spraying bed liners, you know, I was around a lot of rough dudes. There's a lot of rough necks, and that didn't help my situation at all, um, which is probably why my father-in-law tried to minister to me um, like he did, um, take me fishing, take me hunting. And when he would get me alone, he would always be like, how's your, uh, how's your walk with the Lord? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't have an answer for you. Or I'd lie to him and be like, it's good. You know, just so he wouldn't have to say anything. Sure. But he knew, you know, um, and so... So that's where it, that's where it started. I was at Ryan Chevy. That was my first job. And when I moved back to Louisiana, I sprayed bed liners, and um, I, I didn't love the job, but it it paid bills. It provided and it helped us get on our feet for a little bit, you know. So that's where I, that's where it all started. How did he win you over, man? Uh, you know, you kind of set the stage up to where you're um, uh, you've got a young child. Mm -hmm. You're recently married. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you've left the comfort of home behind. Oh, yeah. You're in a place where you don't really have any connections. You're relying on other people. Mm-hmm. How does someone like that win you over? Man, see, that's the thing is he didn't. The one that won me over was uh, when I decided one day to actually go to church. Yeah, well, win me over is probably not the right term. Yeah. But well, what was that What was that catalyst? What was that one thing that really lit that spark where things started to take see, off? I saw my wife and kids go to church one morning without me, and the, ho- the house was just quiet. You know, we were living with them for a little while, and they went to church every Sunday. First Baptist Calhoun when they lived in Calhoun. And... Um, I remember one morning my wife just peeking her head in the door and going, hey, we're going to church. We'll be back um, around lunchtime. Close the door. I was half asleep, but when I woke up and walked out and there was no one in the house, quiet. I'm like, so my family can get up, get ready, get my son ready and go to church. But I can't. You know what I mean? And so I almost felt the sense of pride. You know, I was like, how, how is she going alone without her man? And I'm staying at home. What are they saying about me? Mm-hmm. So it all started with, no, I need to at least be present. You know, let me at least be present and with my wife when she goes to church. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to get involved in all that. But I would rather be next to her during the service, you know, just so that they don't, people don't go talking about like, well, that man never goes to church, brings his family to church. He just stays at home, whatever. And so it started like that. Now, he ministered to me. He would always point me to Christ in every situation. I was prideful. But then when I started getting involved at the church, that first Sunday, I was, uh, I was, uh, someone came up to me, AJ Toms, who's a dear friend of mine, came up to me and invited me to Sunday school, um, said hi to me, introduced himself, introduced his wife, Mallory, and I uh, met his son, Mozzie, um, at the time that was their only kid, and um, and he was like, man, we just, you know, look, glad to have you here today, and we'd love to see you in Sunday school. If you're interested, you know, come talk to me, and so that kind of just kind of, you know, took me back a little bit because uh, my experience with church was never positive, and no mm-hmm. matter where I went in Florida, it was all about money, 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 you know, Mm -hmm. um, status, the way you look, the way, and people would look at us weird. And, you know, my, my experience with church before that was just, I had a bad taste in my mouth. Um, and so my wife, you know, the one time that we went to church in Florida, one time it was like a horrible experience. And she was like, dang, the one time I can get my husband through these doors and it's a horrible experience. And now that's his visual of church. And so I already went in with like a closed mind, closed heart, closed everything. But that kind of was like, well, he, he didn't seem too bad. You know, let's try that out. Started studying the Word of God because my wife got me a Bible. And, uh, man, through studying, through questions, and almost trying to debunk the Bible, I was led to Christ. Because I could not, there was nothing that I could find that wasn't truth. You know, it's kind of funny you when know? you um, open that door just a little bit to let that Holy Spirit come in oh, and do a little work in you. It's uh, amazing what can happen. He wrecked me. Yeah, and I mean, since then, I've never been the same. I know there's there's good days, there's bad days. And sure. I'm always going to, I mean, you if you're doing something right in the Christian world, you it's, and I can probably agree that the devil's not going to leave you alone. Yeah, you know, um, I think there's a, a little bit of a, um, a bad selling job as believers we've done in the time, uh, over, over history, and uh, people think it's going to be butterflies and rainbows all the mm-hmm. time, but it's hard, yeah. and it's, um, it's worthy Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's fulfilling. That, yep. It's hard. But you will never know true joy mm-hmm. until you make that acceptance. Yep. It's like that uh, graves into gardens. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. That's all I was doing was searching, whether it was through through alcohol after, after work or um, whether it was through uh, – you know, other avenues to, to get away from my family, to, to not have to be, no, no, I have to have com- conversations with my wife that are hard, whether it was financial, whether mm-hmm. it was about our marriage, whether about spiritual. I didn't want to have any of those conversations, so I'd find something else to do to keep, you know, to keep me away from the house or keep me away from my family. And find yourself so, running, right? Man, yeah, I literally was running from God. And so, man, once I found, once I found Jesus at a lay renewal at First Baptist Calhoun in 2018, um, and I gave my life to the Lord. I, I literally was like, that is all that's left is for me to, to profess that I, I want to know him. And I want to continue to to try to know him more, you know, and, and give my life to him. Just surrender all. And, uh, man, I walked up there bawling, um, bawling my eyes out. Just like, you know, this is this is what's left is for me to just surrender. And, um, man, the day I gave my life to the Lord, um, I remember, like, I was just so, like, I was ready to serve. I wanted to serve. I could not wait for next Sunday. I wanted to get behind the soundboard or something, hold the bulletins or hold a door open or 
greet people. I wanted to serve. That was the first thing that came to my mind after I gave my life to Jesus was serve people, love people, serve your wife, serve your family. Now, there's going to be good days and bad days. There's going to be days I don't want to do it. Sure. But, but yeah, that's all I wanted to do was serve. So I got, I got plugged in through sound, you know, and I didn't know how to run sound or nothing. I didn't know anything about music, or, and I still feel like I don't, you know. So wait a minute. But, so during this time, you, you were not playing the guitar. You were not doing piano. Mm -hmm. You were not singing. Nope. None of that stuff. Nothing. I had no idea, no clue. And you're um, an associate uh, at at First West in, yes. in the worship department. Yes. Yeah. And you're on stage most Sundays. Yep. Leading, singing, playing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. It's uh, uh, what drew you to that? Well, I was drugged there, literally. Um, we, uh, you know, I got involved with the sound shortly after that churches always go through transition people sure. leave you know and, and god calls them somewhere else the youth pastor at the time got called to another church well the person that was leading the youth worship also got called to another church so now we're left without a youth pastor and without youth worship so we have these kids that gather on wednesday with no leadership whatsoever and so it was left to parents or volunteers well they approached aj who you know led me to the bible study class that helped lead me to christ and asked him if he would be willing to lead the youth transitionally you know mm -hmm. it always is like hey just for a little bit then it turns into this job so he he decided that he was going to do it um well after he did it we were all you know our sunday school class was on fire we all wanted just to wh wherever there was a need in the church plug in and do it whether it was worship food whatever and so at the time the need was worship and so aj's like man would you be willing to, to like sing a couple songs you can even do it like youtube or something and just karaoke it and i'm like dude i don't number one i, I don't know <laughs> how to do that. Number two, I don't know how to play an instrument. And that terrifies me. No, I don't want to get in front of kids. I'll do anything else for you, bro, but I'm not going to do that. And he was like, all right, okay, okay, no worries. Like, we'll find somebody else. So um, this girl, <coughs> her name was Hope, um, who is a dear friend of my wife and I. We love Hope. Um, so she was there, and um, she she can sing very well. Her dad also sang in, in the choir and with the worship team. Um, and so he asked her if she could fill in. Well, I remember the first Wednesday where we had her fill in, somebody else came and played guitar and, uh, she was singing up there. And I just like, I just, while the worship service was going on, I felt this tug to at least help her with the guitar. That guy that was up there wasn't going to be able to do it for right. long. You know, he's just filling in, but after day two or week two, he's gonna be like, All right, I can't do this anymore. And so I was like, I texted her and I said, Hey, I want you to know that the Lord tugged on my heart and I feel led to help you with guitar. I will learn two songs and help until we find somebody that is suitable to, to lead this ministry. So, and, so hang on, let's back up just a second. So you're watching this kind of play out and you're like, I know I got to step in and do something. Mm -hmm. I've never picked up a guitar in my life. Nope. I don't know chords. I don't know nope. how to read music, but I'm going to, I'm going to commit to learn two songs yep. and I'm going to be, I'm going to jump in and help. That's it. Make, didn't even own a guitar. Did you? No, no, I didn't. Uh, there was an old guitar that was in the back of uh back of the baptistry area that was in a box and uh, i found it turns out it was a youth pastors um that he had left there and he's like well you want two things you can pay me for it or well, i'll just come back and get it later so after a little while i, I paid him for it but he let me kind of like borrow yeah. it and learn you know after after through texting he was like well you just i mean whenever you can pay me for it and so it's just this it was a 12 string guitar by the way too so I had no, I mean, once I learned to play on that thing, when I picked up a six string, I was like, man, this is easy, you know? <laughs> so I got that guitar and I learned to build my life and I learned Great Are You, Lord. Man, talk about putting your yes on the table. Right. And so I got on YouTube and I mean, I watched for hours and I learned and I'm like, well, this isn't too bad. My fingers hurt. I feel like there's going to be blood coming out soon because I was having to get the callus. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned it. Within a week, I learned those two songs. Well, come that Wednesday, um, AJ asked, hey, could you possibly lead those songs and hope to do like a harmony? See if you can lead the worship. I No, I didn't want to do that. I can't do that. I can't sing. I don't know how to. I don't even know how to lead. You know, um, and he said, uh, he said, man, it's just the kids. Like, it, the less you think about it, the easier it's going to be. It's just kids. Like, it's not that big of a deal type deal. I got up on the stage and decided I would pump out those two songs i mean i knew them because i literally sat for hours for a week and listened to them so i know build my life and great are you lord like the back of my hand and um so i got up there and build my life and great are you lord according to my wife we're done at like 300 bpm 
because I was so nervous. <laughs> so I was literally like going through the verses really fast, strumming wow. really fast. Yeah. The worship set lasted five minutes. I got down and was like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I'm still shaking, you know. And uh, I remember a lady coming up to me. Her name is Tara Wallace. Um, that family, too, has been very influential in my walk and my wife's walk. Um, and uh, she came up to me and she said, you are anointed. You should be singing on Sunday mornings. Whatever I got to do to get you up there on Sundays, we will do it. And in the back of my head, I'm like, that was a horrible set. What are you talking about? Like, that was horrible. I was, I was nervous. I was jittery. I was pitchy, you know. And she was like, no, you are anointed. You just need some guidance. We're going to do whatever we can to get you up there on Sunday. And that literally was the that was the start wow. of worship ministry for me. And it turned into a job. It turned into a, a ministry. It turned into a full-time job for a little bit. Um, and, man, uh, since then, the Lord has continued to work through that, through the gifting he gave me of music. I can't read music. I don't know chords. I just know the shapes. I know that they make sense. Um, when I play the piano, I can't tell you what I'm playing, but um, it sounds like it's supposed to be that, you know? Um, and I mean, now I can look at sheet music and it makes sense. Like, okay, if I'm in that key, that is a G, you know, yeah. or an A minor. But initially, I just, through YouTube and through my ear, and that was it. That's all I have. Like, I always say it like when someone says, hey, can you come and lead worship for an event or something? Yep. All I have is my guitar and the Holy Spirit. That is all I have to offer you. I don't have any education. I didn't go to school. I didn't go to college for this stuff. I don't, I didn't go to worship leader school or um, LC, you right. know, where I could, where I could learn the fundamentals of that. I was just through trial and error and through, through heartbreak and through, through people throwing into you, throwing you into a ministry when you're not ready for it, you know, because ministry is tough. Yeah. With no mentorship. I made mistakes. I, I learned through hard, hard, hard times in the church and transitional periods. And, um, but isn't that where we sometimes we get some of the best education? Throwing you in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Literally just consumed me to the point where it, it literally molded me to what the Lord wanted me to be. Now, if I could do things different, I would much rather be under some kind of. Yeah. You know? who, who would not want a relief, a little bit of yes. release, a little bit of pain? Yes. So let's, um, let's go backwards a little bit. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned that your, your father, basically your family has been in the restaurant business mm -hmm. for, as long as you can remember. Yep. Y'all moved around a lot. Uh, your dad ran the uh, El Chico's here in West Monroe. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are sad that it's no longer here. I know. But that's a, um, I guess on some level, that's kind of what has led you to what you're doing now with mm -hmm. Freddy's Tacos. So talk to us a little bit about the recipe talk to us a little bit about your father and the inspiration that he has yeah. when it comes to what you're doing now and uh in october uh during halloween he had this idea of cooking tacos for the parents so now he's like we give kids candy but the parents don't get anything you know we lived in this community big community so there's hundreds of kids going down the street for you know halloween was a big thing where we were at and so he decided one day he's like man i'm gonna stick my cooker out there it's like a walk and I'm just going to, this is recipe that he always cooked for us. It's the four meat taco. It's got the smoked sausage, chorizo, ground beef, and steak. That was his thing. Nobody else, I, I mean, I couldn't get the taco anywhere else. I felt like it was just cooked here at our house. You mm -hmm. know, it was like a, a thing we ate. And um, he started cooking it. And I, and I, like, just remember being like, that's just weird. You know, like, they're going to be like, look, these these people are giving out tacos. That's kind of weird. You know what I mean? Or whatever. I don't know. We. I just felt weird, insecure, whatever that may be. But I was like, Dad, don't do different. that. Dad, that's embarrassing. You know, like you're cooking food. Just give out candy. It's Halloween. Well, this man starts handing out these tacos. And the line was a mile long. People loved them. People ate them. And for years and years and years, he did that. He served the community, did not charge anyone. He would buy pounds of that meat and would stay cooking for three to four hours during Halloween night between 6 and 10, you know, mm -hmm. and would sling tacos until the last parent got it. Or until people were full, or until he just ran out of food, right? And uh, that's that's where that started. And I just remember, man, Halloween was always good because I could get my dad's four meat tacos. You know, he my mom would make the salsa, um, she would cut up the cabbage, you know, like like lettuce, but it was cabbage, mm -hmm. and it was just salsa, cabbage, and a lime, and that was you know the crunch when you bite into the taco was always that like takes me back home, mm. and um, and so it was almost like. 
it was easy for me to get involved with this because it takes me straight back home every time I try it. Every time I take a bite of that taco, I remember Halloween, I remember home, I remember my dad cooking it. And so I got the idea to just to sell something like that. And I remember my dad being like, man, nobody's going to buy that. You know, like it's good, but no one wants to buy it. I mean, it's weird. It's a four meat taco. And I'm just like, dad, you have no idea, man. These people may, this may pop off here. You know, sure. you, I have no, I have, but I won't know until I try it. I was like, but Calhoun has no food other than Sonic, mm -hmm. Country Corner sandwiches, which are fantastic. They have Hunt's Pizza too, and um, and I think uh, and now we have special to me's, but before we didn't. So it was just Sonic, Country Corner, and I think Iron Cactus for lunch. We want options, you know. And people have always said we want options, we want options, we want options for food. So before you continue, <clears throat> you're thinking about going down this path of. I want to start cooking for people. Mm -hmm. I want to give them a taste of what I had. But you also had to know the uh, the toll that it took on your family growing up yeah. with um, being in the restaurant business is tough. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. It's mm -hmm. not always easy to find people that are going to be reliable to help. It's not always easy when you have the ups and downs of the economy to where right. people start tightening their, their financial wallets up a little bit. To, they don't have as much disposable cash, so therefore they're going to start eating more sandwiches at home than going out mm -hmm. to eat. And you knew this going into it because you've experienced it growing up. Oh, yeah. Did that ever cross your mind when you uh, decided that I, I just feel like I have to do this? Yeah, Every, and it still does to this day. Um uh, when, when my, my wife and I discussed me jumping in fully, um, because it, it started as a as a hustle just to provide for daycare, I sold plates to my church, you know, and they they supported. And in my head, I'm like, of course they're gonna support. It could be the crappiest taco they've ever eaten in the world. They're gonna support us, you know. Sure. Um, but the feedback was like, no, 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 Enrique, like it's it's really good. You need to keep doing this, you know. Like think about doing this as like a part time or maybe even like a, a jump into it do catering or something that could help, you know? And so I leaned into the catering thing, did that for a whole year. And there was ups, there was downs. Some events were like, I could have done something better, but I always took notes and was like, I want to do this different. The next event, I want to do this different until I got to the point where catering was just like second nature. You know, I knew what to do in the setting of a wedding or a corporate event or a house when they have people. But you didn't over. have the trailer at this point, right? I did not. It was just catering. And man, everyone always asked like, you, where's your food truck located? I don't have one. And they're like, are you sure? Because I feel like I'm like, I promise you, I don't have a food truck. And, well, you need to get one. You know, I think if you got one, that would be awesome. So you're like, doing all the cooking basically out of your house or all the yeah, breath out of your house? literally and, everything was out of my house. And, I mean, I know that's not right. You know, like you have to have legally, legally thinking for anyone that is interested in this stuff. You have to have a commissary kitchen um, as, a, as a caterer to cook your stuff in a commercial kitchen. And we're not saying he didn't have those things. Yeah, we're not saying, we're just saying that these things are That's correct. Necessary. But you have a co commercial kitchen, you have to have your, your permits to, to sell stuff. You know, I think catering is different too because, you know, you're at, it's private. You mm -hmm. know, so it's just different, you know, there's, there's, little, there's little gray sure. areas there, but for sure you need a commercial kitchen mm -hmm. um, and somewhere you can store your food or whatever. But this kid over here, you know, 25 year old kid, um, I didn't even know where to start with that because my dad always took care of all that stuff. When we were right. growing up, he took care of vendors. He took care of the commercial kitchen stuff and the, the permits and the, all the whatever you need for a restaurant. I was just a busboy or a server or a cook. And so when you start thinking about all the things that go into that stuff, it got a little scary. And so I wanted to only keep it at catering because okay. I knew catering. Um, I had a system down and the people that were contacting me were a friend of a friend. So, you know, but word started to quickly spread where I started to get in clients that I don't know. Okay. And so I almost got a little scary there because I'm like, man, if I, not that I would, but if I got anybody sick or if something happened to where they're like, hey, we, we weren't satisfied and we want to know like where you cook your stuff or whatever. I don't, I can't give you an answer. Luckily, the Lord, I never had to go through something like that. The Lord just kind of blessed the business. Anybody he put in my path, my attitude was do everything with excellence deliver the best that you can mm -hmm. and if that's not sufficient oh well you know they may say something or they may give you a bad review or whatever the experience may be bad but you can only control what you can control that's i know how to make this taco very well i know how to make mexican rice beans and chicken you know shredded chicken tacos whatever and deliver a catering experience that makes them feel like they are like it's a street taco stand in your establishment right i know how to do that good so let me stick to that and man that turned into what I am, where I am today now, 
through all of that stuff, doing that by myself. So how did you how did you reach the finally reach the decision? And I'm sure it wasn't just you, your your wife, mm -hmm. which uh, we haven't spoke of, but I think you probably would be in the same boat as me that without our our wives' support and the things that they do behind the scenes, we wouldn't be the people we are today. One thousand percent. Yeah. And yeah. so you know, my best friend and uh, my business partner, my life partner. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do in business what I do today without my wife. So right. I, I know you're the man in front of us today sitting there, but I don't want to be remiss to not, uh, mention that your wife has to be a big inspiration to try to yeah. keep, keep this floating for you. <clears throat> but talk to us about when you made that decision that, okay, I think we're ready. we got to scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, my wife was like, look, you've been open a year. You've been doing this for a whole year. You've figured out that you want to continue doing this. Part of the catering was trial and error of like, do I want to do this for the, for a good portion of my life um, or for a season? Is this how I want to provide for my family? If I don't enjoy it, don't do it, you know, because it leads to burnout. That affects yeah. ministry. That affects marriage. That affects my relationship yeah. with my kids, with my friends. And so we've been down that road many times. Um, and my wife was like, I want you to be sure that you love to do this and that you still have a passion after a year. And I was like, yeah, I love people. I love serving because I feel like I have a sense of purpose when I'm serving people. Yeah, they're paying me, but at the same time, I want to deliver more than what they even paid for simply because I just, I want people to feel loved, mm. cared for, and like they're the most important people in the room yeah. um, when it comes to that side of business. And so, I mean, I told her, I, I still have a passion for people and a passion for cooking and a passion for that. Um, I'm no chef. I'm no whatever. I just feel like I have a good hand and a good product. That's it. You know, I don't, I wouldn't deem myself a chef or a cook, but we got through a year and um, my wife was like, well, you want to, you're either going to jump in fully or you're not. There's no lukewarm in this. Like you either do this or you quit and pursue full-time ministry. Like there's no, the calling is very evident in your life. You can right. do both. There's balance. It's hard, but there is a balance for between this and this, you know, and a lot of people are doing it now by vocational ministry. And so I was like, yeah, let's let's jump in and start pursuing looking for a truck. And um, man, they're so expensive. Mm, but yeah. um, my uh, my mentor, I call him my mentor and he probably would be like, I'm not your mentor. Um, but just because of the title. But my mentor, who is uh, Jason McGuffey, yeah. um, he's the pastor at Calhoun. What a great Solid guy. dude. I love him to death. I love his family. And um, he's a lot of the reason where I'm at with the trailer today, too. Just encouragement pushing you to want to do things even when you don't want to do them but he called me one day and was like man I found this trailer and uh I, I want you to go let's go look at it and it was so random because at the time I was like we want to do this but let's wait for the door to open and then he calls me and is like I found this trailer it's kind of beat up but a perfect starter trailer for you and I said okay yeah let's go look at it and so the next day this was Saturday the next day was a Sunday after church service we got together and we rode up to Monroe and we found this trailer and I was looking at it, and of course, in my head, I'm dreaming. I'm looking at this trailer, and I'm like, man, I would love to have it, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, and so we talked to the lady, and I was like, look, let me call my bank. Let me see what I can do to, like, get a loan for this, you know. And it was an older it was an older trailer. It's going to be tough to get a loan for an older trailer. And um, I said, man, I even have, like, I have land I can probably put up as collateral towards the loan, you know, whatever. And, um, and Jason was like, look, man, just, he's like, I feel like when you do this, this is going to be the next step for your business. So the Lord is going to provide. Don't worry about the provision aspect. I feel like the door is open. He's going to make something happen. Just lean and trust that this is this is what he wants you to do, you know. Um, and so I said to the lady, let me call my bank. Let me get something figured out. Well, that all got figured out. I had money in my hand to hand to this woman, cash to hand to this woman for this trailer. The next day, and I said, ma'am, I will, I will have it ready for you tomorrow. I can't because it's Sunday. The banks are not open. But tomorrow I will hand you cash. I will meet you up here. This trailer is perfect. She was so nice, whatever, you know, and she even was like, well, I pray to God that when I give this trailer away, it would be to someone who fears the Lord too. It was all great. The next day I get this call or I get a text message after my daughter's ear surgery, and it says, mm. I sold the trailer under you. I'm sorry. I just didn't feel like you were going to have cash for it or whatever. And oh my gosh, my heart sunk to my stomach. I'm like, are you serious? Like, we just got to the point where we said we're going to dive in. The Lord opened this door. The trailer is perfect. We want it. I have the cash now. The Lord opened the door. And the lady sells the trailer. And I was just like, okay, well, now we're back at zero. 
And so I told Jason about it. Jason, of course, is appalled. He's mad. He's all kinds of things. But he's like, you know what? No, don't stop now. Let's go to Facebook Marketplace, start looking. Let's start digging. We need to find something. We need to go make calls. If I got to go travel somewhere to go find something, but don't stop. Because my immediate thing was uh, go and sulk in myself pity. How did it? How did it make you feel knowing that you had someone in your corner that believed so much in you that they were willing to sacrifice their personal time mm. to invest in you and your family? Man, well, like, and I'm I'm keeping a couple of people um, anonymous because if that's what they asked, you know. Sure. Yeah, you know, I ran this by them too, but it, it, Jason is a huge part. There was other people behind the scenes that without them we but wouldn't how, have. But how important is that to you? It's so important. I mean, your yeah. your family support structure is not here. Right, right. It's not though your comfort zone is not here. But right. just to have other people in your life come alongside of you because they believe in you is all God. Uh, and I know it was for everything that we went through from the start. Uh, me meeting my my wife now to to where we're at today. And meeting Jason, First West, the support group at First yeah. West, like it was very evident that this is what God wanted me to do because uh, that Monday it fell through on the sale. That Tuesday, less than 24 hours later, I'm in a 2023 brand new trailer to my name. Nobody stepped in it except me. Between then and the next morning, I had a new trailer and it happened like that. God just opened the door. And, it, and the story about that is even crazier because. I called this person in Alexandria who they build these trailers. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we got 30 or 40 foot ones, these massive trailers. Dude, I don't need anything like that. I need a seven foot one or eight foot Probably one. Probably didn't have anything big enough Max. to pull it, right? Right, I don't. And so uh, I said, man, I got a Jeep. I need something that's one axle light. And he was like, man, we don't, we don't do anything like that. I'm sorry. Um, give us a call back. Maybe in a couple months we may look into doing smaller. And so that was Monday. That was Monday evening. The next morning, that man calls me, and he's like, man, you are not going to believe this. But we just had two brand-new trailers, food trailers, concession trailers, uh, come in, 7 by 14 one axle. And they weigh, you know, they're under that 3,000 mark like you wanted it. He said, are you interested? I said, yes, I'm interested. And I had, I had entrusted Jason with the cash because he had a safe in his house. And so he's like, I was like, man, just keep it because I don't trust myself to have it in my house. I'm all anxious, like, what if the house burns down or what if something breaks in? With my luck, sure, it would happen. Sure, and so we he uh, went to Jason. And I was like, man, this is about to happen. I'm driving to Alexandria. Just pray that it doesn't fall through. Got to Alexandria. He had paperwork. I signed a couple of things. Was approved. Here was the cash for the down payment. I drove away, and that's where the start of the food trailer. You know, I mean, literally. How, bi how big was that grin on your face driving all the way back? To well, I was anxious the whole way home from Alexandria to home because I've never pulled a trailer. Oh, like OK. That. And so I'm just like I was driving like 30 miles so, an hour. So you're like way. white knuckled at that point. Yes. Yeah, so I was like this the whole time. And I had my son in the backseat. And um, I remember my son just going, um, are you ready to are you ready to start selling tacos, dad? And I'm like, yeah, I'm re I need to start selling tacos because now, you know, I'm work I'm working to keep this afloat. And he was like, man, you know, that's really cool. You know, like, you know what you need? And he started doing the whole, you know what you need now? He's like, you need a big old logo right there. I'm going to draw you a logo. And so my son's mind is going. But, like, on the drive home, I was just so excited, so ecstatic. My son was excited. We got home, and he could not wait for mom to pull up to see the trailer. And um, I put the post on Facebook, and it blew up. And people were just like, wow, how awesome that God opened that door because everyone's been asking about food truck. Yeah. And I haven't been able to because just financially that's tough, especially with a family of two kids. Yeah. And we got one on the way. And so it was just like, that just that door's not open right now, people. Like, I'm going to keep, keep the catering and, you know, little gigs here and there or pop-ups, you know, when I can. But for now, a trailer's not possible. And now I have a trailer. And it just from there, moving forward, it just it blew up. But it was because of my support group, the people that are anonymous. But who I love them dearly. Without them, we would not be where we're at today as Freddy's Tacos with a food truck. And Jason played a huge part in that too in encouraging, praying, and supporting uh, this kid who is just, in my head, I'm just, a, I'm just a worship associate. You know, like, what do you see in me? You know, I, I don't see what you guys are telling me, but what do you see in me that you want to invest time and effort in all of this? That's, you know, that's one of the, the beautiful things about... <clears throat> This podcast is possible because of your support of our real estate business. 
If you're looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, I'm confident we have the tools and the processes to help you reach your real estate goal. For more information or to reach out to us, check out the podcast description for our contact info. About being a professed believer in the community that can wrap around Mm -hmm. you if you allow them to. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, one of the things, and I'm sure you're not naive to this and have heard it yourself, you know, I don't want to go to that church. It's just too big. I mean, I just can't connect. Yeah. Well, that really big church gets really small when you get into a small group. Right. 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 When you allow yourself to um, allow others to be in your life, to be part of that community, it's pretty impressive what that community community can do for not only you, but can do for your marriage, can do for your entire family. Mm-hmm. And the things that you have opportunities to do for others because you see a need that you know now that you can fulfill. Mm-hmm. Maybe not everybody is in a position to help somebody get a business off the ground, <laughs> but maybe they are in a position to watch their kids in the evening while they're trying to get something off yes. the ground. So everybody's got a place, but mm-hmm. if you just plug yourself in, mm-hmm. um, you will be more fulfilled throughout the process. Mm-hmm. What are some, so we got to the point to where you've got a trailer now, but le- leading up to just even launching the uh, the food truck, what are some of the obstacles that you face that you're like, man, I just don't know that this is going to be it for us. I, when we started this podcast, we wanted to talk with entrepreneurs and you're going to fall right in that category, mm-hmm. but also you're going to fall in that category of, of leadership because I, I see a leader in front of me. <clears throat> but I want people to understand that anything worth having is going to take work. Oh, yeah. um, you can't just hope that something is going to happen and it just works out lands in your lap. you got to put in the work. But sometimes you can work smarter instead of harder. Right. Sometimes you can learn from others' mistakes. Mm-hmm. What are some of the mistakes you felt like that you made in the process that had you had a, just a little bit of guidance in the beginning that you, you may would have paid for fewer mistakes down the road? Because mm-hmm. mistakes can get costly. Right. Um, man, so I did not I did not know walking into this that the food trailer, once I got it, you know, it, it does. It's not just get a food trailer and just go start selling. There's permits. There's health inspections. There's um, things that you have to have up to code in your trailer, what you're holding your food in, cold and hot. Your sinks, all that have to. You have to be able to have running hot and cold water. Three compartment sinks with an extra hand sink on the side. And in Louisiana heat, you need air conditioner. You know, and and so and, and a fire extinguisher for your. You know, if, in case something lights up in your grill or whatever. And so there are so many little things that I had no idea uh, what I was getting into and how costly it was going to be um, for permits and stuff like that, um, which I feel like, and I'm not going to speak for every other food truck in the area, but I feel like is the reason it's so tough to do what food trucks are doing um, and even want to continue is the obstacle that we always run into is, do we have the proper permit? I didn't even know that permit existed, you know, or we get something in the mail about, yeah, I know there's... There's state tax and there's federal tax, but we also have local tax too, you know, and there's something, you know what I mean? And so it was, it almost felt like no matter what I did, there was another piece of paper I had to sign. There was another permit I had to purchase. So would you say that it would be beneficial if our local government could have just a a one page thing? If you want to operate a food truck, these are all the things that you need to have to be successful, to open your business up in our community. Absolutely. And, and I don't know, maybe there is something out there like that. I'm gonna, that I, I, I know some people. I'm going to ask a question. Can we get a one-pager yeah. on how to open up a food truck? Yeah, that would be. And, I, you know, it's funny you say that because what I want to do now, because I was so aggravated and frustrated during that process, just to even get started, it took me a month, a month and a half to even be able to start selling after I had bought the trailer. Because so, there's just so much red tape involved yeah, in getting for a it. month and a half, you know, I mean, I could do a pop-up here at a friend's house, you know, or whatever, but for a month and a half, I couldn't go set up at a parking lot in West Monroe or Monroe just because I didn't have the proper stuff, you know? Um, and so, yeah, if I could do anything to help people that are starting food trucks or even thinking about doing food trucks, I want to, I'll just, I want to help with that list because I know now the laundry list of things. I, I wrote everything down that I've done, you know, to get to, get to where you can operate. To where you get that final, here's the check mark. You are now health inspected. You now have the document that says you can get a permit to operate. So you know you before you operate anywhere, 
you need that letter of approval from the LDH. Right. And so that, but I would love to, if there was one page, you know, like, hey, this is what you need, Enrique, before you even get into it. And I read that before I went to go look for a food trailer, I'd be like, maybe we need to wait a little bit. <laughs> you know, like, let me wait a couple more months or whatever. But you live and you learn. Sure. I made a lot of mistakes and I still make, I'm making mistakes and learning and growing through, through that aspect. Because, I mean, I've only been doing it. The food trailer business, I mean, two and a half, three months, you know. Yeah, but just look and at so, the growth that you've had in, in that two and a half to three months. Yes. And it's like it's getting bigger. I mean, how, how often do you actually run out of food? All the time. And um, and you probably each time you plan for more. Right. And, it and is, you plan for more. It is, yeah. And that's why I feel so bad when I have to tell people I'm sold out or like an hour and a half before I'm supposed to be closed at two, I'm done. And it's not because... Not because I don't cook enough food, because I cook a bunch of food. 300, 350 tacos in a in a in a setting or a sit in one sitting when you're selling that for a lunch period. That's a lot of food. That's, That's a, a lot, lot of food. tacos. That's a lot of people. And um, but one thing I want whoever's listening to understand is I can only fit so much food in my trailer. Right. You know, before it gets sketchy. You know, I can I can set trays of meat or whatever in these random things, you know, and not have them holding and hot. But I could I risk the potential of getting somebody sick. I'd rather my food be good yeah. and have to tell somebody, one hundred percent. You know what I mean? Than than to just be able to sling it all day, yeah. for everyone to try. But I can't hold this at temp. But when I do get to be able to hold it to temp and I pour it in there, it's no longer safe to eat. Yeah. There's so much that goes into that. It's not just cooking and it's hope, that balance. You have to know how to keep your food hot. You have to make sure that you're not going to poison somebody through uh, bacterial growth of it. Just sitting. But just even the quality of it. I mean, who right. wants a a bad name out there no. that these are the worst tacos no. ever nobody wants that no and there's a lot at stake too because i get my meat from specialty meats of calhoun they're awesome they're also great supporters of freddy's tacos and i hear that those guys are doing i don't know who runs guys or gals but they do some amazing work i have not yes. had the pleasure of going in there but i saw that that's where you get your food from yes. so we're gonna have to go check them out for yeah, sure. Yeah, best steaks, best boudin, in my opinion. But I'm not from here, so don't hold my. This is my <laughs> opinion. But best boudin, best steaks, um, and um, they do lunch plates throughout the week. And on Saturdays, which I'm sure they're gonna still do this because it's been so successful, they do barbecue plates. Okay, great. It is so it is so good. But they have been huge supporters. Charlie out there is the owner. Okay. And um, and man, that's at stake. If I if I do something to get somebody sick or it's a it's a product that's not quality or somebody reports me to the health department says man that got me sick go check them out and i get inspected they're not going people think it's like no we're going to shut you down no they're going to trace back to where i got my food from and start from square one mm -hmm. so okay where did you buy this batch of meat uh bought it at specialty meats yeah so now they're no longer on my tail yeah. they're going to knock on specialty meats door that's their money that's their business that's their reputation sure it matters that i push out something that is number one safe quality but also i'm all my ducks are in a row when it comes to food safety that matters because one mistake can cost your whole you know what i mean and as you know people people will get sick at i've gotten sick many times at chain restaurants i still go back and eat so people will go get sick at mcdonald's and i oh mean you know what whatever i'll just give it a month and i'll go back and eat another but big that's small business small business hit. when you when you hit somebody with something like that yeah people are 99 percent of the time not gonna go back yeah but they'll go and support, you know, me too. I'm speaking to myself. I'll go support this big time chain who gives a rip about me. I'm just a number. But this small business who needs my sale, one little mistake or whatever or inconsistency, I no longer want to support you guys. That's just. What, what are your parents thinking now? You know, you've been you've been doing this for a little while. Your dad's like, nobody's going to want to buy that taco. Man. I mean, it's just it's what we cook around the house. It was a uh, it was made evident. It was made evident to him that this was a serious thing. He came a couple of weeks ago, um, and I had him in the truck. I wanted him greeting people um, because I'm like, this is the name. This is Freddie. This is who he, you know. This this is the guy behind the recipe. Come and meet him today if you want to. And I was set up behind Glenwood Surgical Center, mm -hmm. and um, I set up there. And my dad, you know, it was it was 11 o'clock, and my shift was from 11 to two. It was 11 o'clock, and for about 30 minutes, we had nobody come up, and he was just like man, it's just a slow day today. And I'm like, man, you just wait. Wait till about 11.45, 12 o'clock. We're going to get swamped. And he's like, man, well, you're all the way back here. Like, you got to go through Thomas Road, skip all those restaurants that are fast food, take a ride at that Walmart, and go all the way back to come and find you. And I'm like, no, you're right. It is way out of the way. I was like, I'm telling you, my support, my customers, 
they go they go out of their way to come find me. And sure enough, at eleven forty five, we were swamped. I sold out in an hour that day. Wow. And him him and my mom were just like, Oh, this is this is good. You know, like this can be a good thing. Um, or it's turning into something that is like a machine. You know, if you do it right and you make sure all your ducks are in a row, right. um, and you have a system and you make you know, you're doing you're doing everything you can to make sure your books and everything are just balanced and you know, whatever you gotta do this could be a good thing. You know, it could be a blessing. And so that's when it was made evident to him that like, I'm not just, I'm not just doing this on the side. This is a it's full blown business now, you know? And so, so he saw it from when I started to where I'm at today, you know, when I decided to sell place at the church to trailer today. And so I, it, I think it was cool f- for him to see that, you know, and, and where they're at, they're, they're proud. My mom is proud. My dad is proud. And I know they have to be, they tell everybody about my food trailer at home. I'm sure. Um, and, and that my dad has family in Houston, Texas. When he goes up there, he tells everybody about my food trailer. And so, yeah, they're, well, they're proud. It's definitely exciting to, um, uh, see a young man like yourself that, uh, realizes that there is, um, a passion that, that you can, you can step out in if you, if you're willing to put the work into it, Oof. just about anything is possible. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Having your right, your life right with the Lord, makes it easier. Mm-hmm. Being able to have a partner like a spouse that's behind you helps ensure success. Because mm-hmm. if you're not working together mm-hmm. at that goal, um, life can get pretty messy at that point. Yeah. And then to see you lead worship at church on Sundays. Mm-hmm. I know before we started recording, uh, I mentioned. Why don't I see more of your music online? Mm-hmm. So it's my encouragement to you today is um, keep doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people, when it comes to business, they think, okay, well, I'm going to start scaling really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, take advantage of this. So be smart when you start scaling. Um, you've got a great head on your shoulders. I love what you're doing in our community. And um, don't be afraid to stick more of you online with your music. I think it. I think you have an audience of people that um, – uh, would love to hear that other side of you. Yeah. And um, I just really appreciate it. And I'm just very thankful that you decided to come in and do this with me so that, that I can just share with our community that if you have a passion and you want to make something happen, it is possible. Mm-hmm. So thanks for coming mm-hmm. out and doing this podcast with me. Yeah, man. Me. Thank you, man. I'm humbled by the opportunity. And um, it was it's cool to just be able to lay out. You don't think about the extent of God's work until you start talking about it. Yeah. Um, kind of like testimony, you know. We don't ever really give our testimony on a daily basis, you know. When, you know, you just you just walk around saying, "Hey, you want to hear my testimony?" We should, yeah. but when you finally let it out, you just realize the amount of work the Lord has been doing in your life and continuing to do in your life, and the people's lives that it's touched and affected right. through the entire process. Yeah, that um, that ripple effect, um, mm-hmm. uh, we truly don't understand the reach of that. But you know, we're called to make disciples. We're called to be able to tell our testimony. We're called to. Uh, be good, productive people in society and help others when help is needed. So, man, I really appreciate what you're doing for our community. Um, I appreciate the the giving of the time you involve in the worship at our church. And I can't wait to see where this takes you. And Amen. hopefully I'm going to see if I can do something about I don't have much pull in this town, but I know a few <laughs> people that I'm going to say, hey, look, I was talking to someone the other day, and, man, it's a pain in the rear to get a food truck up and running. Yeah. Can we just have a one-page report that yeah. they can just get and say step one through ten? Yeah. Be easy for them? should Absolutely. take a month and a half. Yeah, I would love to advocate for people like that, too. You know, where So I'm going to help on that path with yeah, you. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. Enrique, thank you for coming in and doing this, and I just look forward to see where tomorrow leads us. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this podcast. We really appreciate your involvement. Please leave us a comment or even better yet, subscribe to this podcast and hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted for every new episode when it hits. Mm